Hi folks, welcome back. Today we're going to go further in on the Nikon ZF and compare it to a couple of the different models in the system. I hope you saw the video that just went live giving you my first hands-on impression with it. It was pretty rushed though and there is actually a lot of new stuff in this one which on one hand surprises me at the price point. It's I was kind of shocked that they've included so much in this guy, but it is going to make your decision a little bit difficult because now comparing it to a ZFC, a Z6, or a Z8, there's lots of overlap in different areas and you're really going to have to think about which features you need and what is going to work for you in terms of the price. So, we have Felicia. Most yeah. importantly, how are you? Yeah, great. That's great. Now, Felicia is a photographer as well, so hopefully I can convince her to get some photos today because we've got these that can be cool props and we've got this retro studio, so we'll have some, I think it's a nice little mix up to have her also shooting in the portraits. Now, we've got here the FM2. This is what the new ZF is actually based on. And when you line them all up, if you're not looking at the back because the extra buttons really gives it away, looking from the front and the top, there really is a lot of, you, you can clearly see the design cues. Now, looking at them side by side, yes, it is bigger than something like the FM2, but considering it's got the NEL15 battery in there, and it actually has overall better ergonomics. If you're putting big lenses on these old cameras, I think the tribute is obviously there in terms of design cues, but you need some kind of a melding with the modern ergonomics. Otherwise, you just wouldn't want to be shooting something like this that has the ergonomics of a VHS cassette with a big prime modern lens attached to it. Looking at it compared to the ZFC, however, there's actually not a huge size difference. There is a difference in weight. Felicia found the ZF a little bit heavy. I actually find it a lot nicer in the hand than the ZFC. But considering you're going from APS-C to full frame, it's really not a big jump in size, in my opinion. So let's just get started shooting. We'll run you through some of the different specs and I'm going to compare it in this video to the Z8, which is you know, it's Big Brother. They do, however, both share things like 3D tracking and some of the advanced video modes. And I've got the Z7 II here. This is closer to the Z6 II, but other than the sensor, they're pretty much the same camera. So we can compare these three, see how they do in terms of performance. A big one I know a lot of you are interested in, in particular, is the autofocus. So we'll definitely go in depth on that. Whilst you're over at my website, learn.mattgrainshirt.com, you can check out my Nikon Expert Setup Guide. It's already been updated for the Nikon ZF. It includes every camera in the range, full frame and APS-C. We'll take you through the initial setup, what every single button on every camera does, all the different things that you want to think about customizing from the outset, as well as a menu deep dive that takes you through every customizable option on these cameras and walks you through each of the new features on the different bodies as they come out. You can check that one out, links below. Now, as I mentioned, there's a big overlap in terms of features. I don't want to harp on this, but I was hoping for, and I'll have to make a follow-up video comparing my wish list to what we actually got, but I was really hoping to see the x 7 come to this generation of camera, you know, rather than the dual x 6s that kind of thing, and we actually got it. And as well as having more focus points than the Z6 II or the Z7 II, it does add in 3D tracking, which was something that a lot of people were happy to see in the Z8 and Z9. And I wondered if they were only gonna keep it at that price point. But now something coming in at literally half the price, having that is great. But it's not having all of the focus options of the Z8 and 9. So to see where it sits in terms of its ability to detect eyes, stick with the eye, its accuracy, that kind of thing compared to those cameras, I've got my Atomos, so let's actually record all three of the different cameras in the same settings, in the same lens, and see how they do. But in this kind of scenario, people who are shooting portraits, and trust me, I see your comments, I hear the complaints, that the Z6 II and Z7 II just haven't got the focus upgrades that people were hoping for. Obviously there were big firmware updates, but not up to like the Z8 level. 
for this kind of thing, for portraits, I really don't think people are going to have anything to complain about anymore because it may not be quite at Z8, Z9 level, but it's picking her up, it's finding her out through all of the foliage, really with no issues. Okay, let's try the Z72 next. Okay, so you can see it there straight off the bat. It does, the Z72 is noticeably behind, easier to get lost. Put this in the background and then not going straight to face. It's got the region, just turn a little towards me. Okay, there we get the eye. Put this in the background. I gotta say, I personally have always found this fine for this kind of portrait, but yes. Oops, shooting it side by side. So these kind of situations do happen where She's there, she's clearly in the frame, but we've got to get everything out for it to actually get her. Yeah, so definitely noticeable difference. The ZF is performing better than the Z72, which is gonna make a lot of people happy. Now, the big brother, twice the price. Let's see how the Z8 does in the same situation. Okay, so what a surprise. <laughs> the second top camera in the range that costs twice the price is more accurate and more responsive. I'm sure this is surprising absolutely no one. Yes, there is a clear differentiation between them. At the price point, if this is all you're going to be doing, this kind of portrait shooting, then I really think any of them will work, but the Z6 and Z7 II may be light, less reliable, less quick to pick it up, may occasionally need a manual focus adjustment to get it exactly where you want it. But as I said, there's so much more differentiating these cameras that you need to think about. And an important one is, does 24.5 megapixels work for you? It's not going to work for everyone. If for a lot of people who I, I hear from you guys, it's kind of split. Some people saying I would never go back below 36 or whatever now, and others saying that they just don't need those megapixels. They wanted something right around 24. So I know there's gonna be a lot of people out there that this camera absolutely is a home run for you. For those of you who, however, do a mix of shooting portraits or stuff for social media, but also want to do landscape and higher resolution work. That's where the first of the, I was surprised to see it introduced on this camera feature comes in. This guy does have pixel shift. It's the first Nikon Z camera to introduce it. It'll shoot up to 32 frames, slightly moving the sensor around. So this is really for tripod work, not gonna work for portraits, that kind of thing. You need everything locked down and the sensor moves just that tiny little bit will take up to 32 images. You can choose how many. It'll stitch them together and you can get up to, I think it's a 96 megapixel image. So you can really get a super high res image from this lower res sensor. So taking a look at the new guy, it has some features that have never been in a Nikon uh, mirrorless camera, let alone a full frame one. And Maybe it's just that the technology is ready now for Nikon to release, but I'm kind of surprised that at $2,000 they're being debuted in this camera. So that new feature I mentioned, this is the first uh, full frame Z camera that has the touch function enabled when you're using the EVF. So when you have it set up so that when you put your eye to the viewfinder, the rear screen turns off, you're then able to use this rear screen. So just showing you through the menu system here, go into controls, touch function, so we've got it turned on. And then you can have it to move your focus points, switch eyes, grid framing, zoom on and off, or virtual horizon. So let's say, for example, move focus point. Then I will put it into, uh, let's say, just single point. Now, as my eye goes up, everything is off, but you can see I'm touching here and I'm able to move that point around to where I want it to go. So that's pretty handy to not then have to, you know, use the 
the rear command dial or something like that to move it exactly where you want it. Jumping back into the menus, the other option is to have it be, or the other one that it will be of interest is to switch eyes. So if we go back to wide area mode, so there it's got the left eye. If I swipe up, it jumps to the other eye. Swipe up, swipe up, swipe up. So it'll just keep switching between the two. We also have virtual horizon. So you can see down the bottom left corner, the function and the finger pointing up. I think that means swipe up and there you go. There's my horizon, swipe up and it's off again which you can also do with the display button. Um, zoom on, off, and then you can choose your magnification. So let's say 200. So here we are on the eye, I swipe up, and then it goes straight into 200%. So that's pretty handy for people who are going to be adapting lenses. And I think this is also the first that's going to give you the eye detect even when you're using a manual focus lens. So when you're in full manual mode, Let's just switch to that. And we uh, manually focusing, it still does pick up the eye and face for us. And then here I'm able to swipe up, go straight into 200% and quite easily see once we've got things in focus. So whilst it may not have, you know, the special mount, that kind of thing, like the DF had that lets you make use of the legacy glass, it does have some features built in here, especially for people who might want to be using older glass and manually focusing with the ZF. A couple of other things that this has that is a first for a Nikon Z camera. It's got a new system that's kind of tying the in-body vibration reduction or IBIS to your focus point rather than just using the central point of the sensor. So typically Nikon cameras, and I think all cameras with IBIS, are basically using the central point of the sensor and using that to calibrate it so that when it's moving to you know, counteract the movement of your camera, that's how it does it. This guy now will allow you to tie it to your focus point. So if I'm not using the central point, instead I'm using say the top right hand point to depending on where my model is in the frame, it'll tie it to that point. And they say that improves the outcome and it gives you up to eight stops thanks just to the in-body. Now, I'm not really sure how that makes a big difference. Maybe when you're dealing with movements like your, the up and down, these kind of movement ones, then the outer edges are obviously moving more than the central point, so it needs to factor that in more so that you don't get a little bit of warping, potentially. I will try a little bit of hand holding now and see how it does. Shooting using the standard VR mode, we got shots at a hundredth, a sixtieth, a fortieth, a couple down at a twenty-fifth and a tenth, and even one that was pretty close to sharp at one sixth of a second. Switching over to the focus point VR, hundredth, eightieth, a thirtieth, an eighth, and I did even get some down at a quarter and one third of a second. So potentially one stop better performance. Now in terms of the interface with the camera, you know, a top line plus for me is that they have managed to squeeze the NEL15 battery in here. I was kind of expecting that it may get the smaller battery. Very happy to see that it hasn't. In terms of card slots, this has been well recovered. You've got a single SD, which is UHS-2, and then tucked in just in front of that, it's actually kind of hard to get to, is a micro uh, SD card, which is supporting UHS-1. Now, I'm kind of in two minds about it. Of course, I would rather have two, you know, full SD cards, or, you know, I'm so used to using CF Express Type B now, but it's kind of like me trying to squeeze into this size medium shirt. They've, <laughs> this camera is so jam packed into such a compact package, something has to give. So if you're comparing it against having just one SD card, and now you've got a micro that you can just kind of leave in and think of it as internal, internal storage as just a backup, then it's actually a really great thing. If you're really dying to have two matching media formats, you don't have that on this. In terms of the I.O., it does have mic in and headphone out, which is great. The ZF, there's so many cameras here, I don't know which is which, didn't have the, the two of them. 
Um, you've also got HDMI out. This one is using micro. So now we have all three, if you're in the current lineup, the Z, F using micro, the Z6 and Z7 using mini, and then the Z8 and Z9 using full-size HDMI. Working in production, I would rather everything just has full-size, but again, there just isn't space for it on this camera. So, you know, be careful if you're using HDMI. You will note on the top of this camera, it's much closer to the previous button layout, especially its forebear, the FM2, with the style of the shutter release. And you'll notice the little cutout there, that is for you to be able to screw in a shutter release. So a really nice throwback that none of the other cameras have had. It's also the first full frame that has this fully articulating screen. And as I mentioned, any camera, whichever, I would hate to design a camera because you know if there's two options, it's gonna be 60-40 who wants it and who doesn't, and the 40% who doesn't are always the most vocal. So I know a lot of people uh, you know, think of this kind of screen as being a vlogging screen, and yes, if you're doing vlogging, it is super handy, but one thing I actually quite like about it, if you put it this way, it makes it look much more like the old film camera. So if you wanna go around and not be reviewing your shots all the time, you can hide that away. Also nice for being in your bag. It also still lets you get really nice angles if you're shooting down low or up high to be able to still see your screen. So it's up to you. If I had to choose between this or what the Z6 and Z7 have, I would actually probably choose this one for this style of camera. The USB-C is a power direct, so you're able to charge via that guy. It's coming in all black, black on black on black, but you are able to, there's six different colored wraps that you can get from Nikon and have applied to customize it in green and brown and orange and all different kinds of colors like that. So again, I do think the overall layout, it does match it really nicely. Of course, there's more on these cameras because there's so much more to them than this kind of old film camera. But the layout of the dials, having the tiny little screen on top, doesn't give you loads of shooting details, but it does, you know, it's reminiscent of your film counter on the FM2. And you basically can get instant access to look at everything that you need. It would still be really cool to see Nikon come out with some lenses for this kind of camera. Maybe not tiny manual focus ones, but ones that do still have an aperture ring on the actual lens. Or of course you can do that if you're shooting with like a 51.2, you can customize the control ring to be for your aperture and then it's got the LCD screen there on the lens for you. But just having one that has a proper clicking aperture, whether it's focus, like doing it by wire or it's actually connected, I think would be really nice to round out the mechanical look and feel of this kind of camera. Okay. So as I mentioned, this guy has the dedicated black and white switch there. So you've got the new deep and flat monotone, as well as the rich tone portrait. I'll get samples of all three of these that I'll let you just have the JPEG straight out of camera. You can download them over at my website. And it also inherits the skin softening in stills and video that we saw on the Z8. So I'll get some stills in that as well, so you can check those out. It the even makes is quite good. Maybe oh. surprised because I keep thinking Nikon might be not that great. 
that's fine. It's your opinion. That's fine. <laughs> You're just saying that because I always use Nikon and our photos always look so terrible. Is that, is that the problem? Oh. It'll shoot out here. Ah, but you can still get the feeling. Oh, that one is better. Tell me why. Uh, actually, I think this one might be heavier, but yeah. seems like the texture is better. When you say texture, what do you mean? The act physical texture. Okay. Well, she's so good. This does have the Nikon uh, proud of the texture that it's more realistic and more similar to the old film ones. For me, I mean, and it's going to be like where obvious difference. For me, a small camera with big hands is just annoying. But something like if you're comparing it to say like, uh, dare I say it and invoke the wrath of the Sony army, comparing it to something like a Sony, there's so many small little buttons that I find it really uncomfortable to use. Something like this that has big manual dials on it, a bit like the Fuji's, is a lot easier to use. And comparing this ergonomically to the ZFC, I prefer this, but also comparing it to the, they, you probably have never seen this one, but there was a Nikon DF, which was the DSLR version that was much chunkier and I think the grip was less substantial. It was actually less comfortable to shoot with than this one as well. So I think they've done a pretty great job in balancing the retro look and feel with what we expect these days, which is actually a camera that's comfortable to shoot with. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this is a little surprise. So we've only been shooting stills. It is warm in here, but we've gotten the yellow temperature warning. It then, of course, goes to red and everything before it shuts down, but only shooting stills, I guess that's what happens when you have so much in a compact package. Okay, folks, so a little bit less rush today, but still, you know, we didn't have heaps of time. It was a basic portrait shoot, essentially. You can see once you start comparing different cameras, things get a little out of control and you end up shooting with a whole bunch of equipment. It is actually from a distance a little bit difficult to tell which is which. Which is the one we were testing? This one. Well done. So. Circling back to the premise of this video, comparing it against the other models in the system that you might be thinking about. The ZFC, and this may all shift in the next month or so, as once the ZF is out, you may see some price fluctuations, but at the moment, the ZFC is 1,000 US. The Z62 is 2,000, but it's already been discounted in some markets. You can expect to see that probably drop a little bit more because the new guy is coming in at 2,000 with all of those extra features. Then you jump up to 4,000 for the Z8. So whilst there's an overlap in features that does make it difficult and the marketers are so great at figuring that out to you know, justify the upgrades to the next model, the next model, the next model, I think ZFC to ZF, we don't have, is that it? <laughs> ZFC to ZF. It's, it's a big difference between the two, APS-C versus full frame. The overall feel of the ZF, I don't want to trash it, but it always did feel a bit plasticky. Comparing it to the ZF, it's noticeably so now. I think 
you know, well, essentially if you're looking for full frame and you're looking for 3D tracking and all of these great things and the XBeat 7 processor, it's an obvious difference. But if you're just wanting retro and you want to save a thousand dollars, the ZFC would be the option for you. The Z8 to the ZF, there's so many numbers and letters flying around here. If you're looking to do high res, you want to do 8K video, you want to do things like 4K 120, it's just a more powerful overall camera. It does also have uh, the traditional grip, which is when you're using lenses like the 51-2, you know, this lens on this body is going to be difficult. You'll want to have the additional grip on that, I would say. Uh, apparently in most markets, it's going to be the small rig that I was testing in New York City available. In Japan, they're going to have Nikon branded grips available for sale. So that's a big jump, $2,000 to $4,000. You're really going to need the resolution and video. And to be honest, for a lot of people, they do want that 45, 46 megapixel these days. The hard choice is between the Z6 II and the ZF. They never do just one. Let's see. That was actually a nice little break for thinking. Having thought about it a little bit more, I actually don't think it is that difficult a decision. Do you want full frame and all of the latest tech? Then you want the ZF, not the ZFC. Do you need 8K and the higher resolution and the extra features of the Z8? and you have double the budget, then the Z8 is the camera for you. And comparing the Z6 II and the ZF to each other, very similar price, but the ZF is ahead in just about every regard, other than like having the micro SD and SD combo. It's ahead in so many ways, and you can just ignore the retro if you're not actually into that. So having thought about it a little bit more, I actually think bang for buck, the ZF, again, discounting, not putting any value on the retro styling, would have to be the best value full frame in the Nikon Z lineup at the moment. Having said that, for me, who wants the resolution and the speed and the ability to shoot all day and never overheat, the Z9 is the right camera for me. But if you're just looking at what cameras offer what features and you know have the good tracking, have the good eye autofocus and the good processor, then the ZF is uniquely positioned at only, only $2,000 and it's offering you a lot more than the Z6 and Z7 II are, a lot more than the ZF, and it's really just missing out on resolution and extra video and a few different features that the Z8 is offering you. So it's actually not that difficult a decision, it's just what's your budget going to allow and which one's actually going to suit your needs. So I hope you found that useful folks. Check out the sample files below. You can also check out Felicia's Instagram there. And whilst you're over there, check out the Nikon Expert setup guide already set up for the new ZF camera and every other mirrorless camera in the Z range. Thanks, and we'll see you soon.